Okay, so we're on the third phase, which is going to be um, cell response. And the important thing to know here is that ultimately a signaling transduction pathway, it can lead to regulation of one or more different cell activities. Okay, so you can either regulate protein synthesis, which can happen in the nucleus, or you can regulate the actual activity of a protein, which would happen more so in the cytoplasm. Um, so your diagram here on the left is actually in your textbook, and it's an example of transcription factors. Okay, so in this particular example, what's happening is you have your initial signaling molecule, which is your growth factor, and it's binding to a receptor protein, which then triggers um, this phosphorylation cascade, right? And then, so the last um, kinase in the sequence, and in this case it would be active protein kinase 3, that will enter the nucleus and it will activate a gene regulating protein, or otherwise called a transcription factor. Okay, and then this protein will actually start transcription of a specific gene. And so then therefore, we have mRNA that then directs the synthesis of that particular protein in the cytoplasm. Okay, so that would be the example transcription factors. And then over here on this side, on the right hand side, we have an example of the glycogen breakdown or glycogen phosphorylation. So in this particular example, what's happening is you have your epinephrine, the hormone, is your um, first ligand, okay, and it binds to the G-protein linked receptor, or your GPCR, and then it will activate a succession of, or kind of like that domino effect, right, um, a cascade of, of relay molecules, which remember relay molecules are also called proteins. That's why you have active G-protein. Um, you have active protein kinase A, all these different proteins. And so including cyclic AMP, so cyclic AMP, and then also two protein kinases. Okay. Um, so the final protein in this particular um, example is going to be activated by glycogen phosphorylase. Okay. Um, and then that actually uses an inorganic phosphate to release glucose monomers called glucose 1-phosphate. And um, this pathway itself, and of course that a whole activity right there, that is the act of actually breaking down glycogen. right? But one thing to remember is that this pathway itself can be amplified. Um, okay, so let's move on. Oh, here we go. So this figure was also in your textbook, actually, and this is where um, essentially they were doing an inquiry study and where the yeast cell binds a mating factor, okay, so your mating factor is going to be your ligand in this case, um, from a yeast cell of the opposite mating type, and they found that when that happened, this actually caused a signal transduction pathway that then caused the formation of a SHMO, like S-H-M-O-O, -S a SHMO, okay? And a SHMO is just kind of like a little odd projection out of the cell. Like if you look in this picture, this would be your normal cell wall, and then this is kind of like an odd projection outside of the cell, right? So they noticed that that would cause a SHMO, and they thought, you know, well, is this because of the kinase FUS3 or FUS3, or is it maybe because of the protein formin that controls the construction of, of these different microfilaments? Um, what is it, right? So to examine the roles of these two, they actually studied two different mutants called Delta FUS3 or Delta formin. Okay, so this mutant yeast cells, they had no kinase. Okay, because the FUS3 is the kinase. And then over here, they had no formin, so they didn't have the protein formin. And they would stain the cell walls with green fluorescent dye. And then these were exposed 
to the mating factor, and then they were again stained with red fluorescent dye to encode for the new um, cell wall growth. Okay, so then what they found was, because they compared it like this mutant and this mutant, and they compared it with the wild type um, yeast cells. And they found that the wild type yeast cells, you know, you have both the green and the red dye signifying the new growth. Okay, and then it also showed that it was an asymmetrical growth. Okay, so they had schmooze. But then over here, they found that what they mainly found was yellow. Like this looks a little bit, if you look really closely, the walls look kind of yellow on this one. And then they also look kind of yellow over here too. And so they determined that obviously there was no growth. And they figured, hmm, since they're all yellow, that must mean that the red and the green fluorescent dye color kind of merged together. So it simulates um, a more symmetric type of growth. And so therefore, they concluded that, okay, the, they must not be exposed to the mating factor. And it happened in both of the mutants, right? So they figured, wow, that's, that must mean that both of these proteins, both the FUS3 and the formin, must be required for the SHMU formation when the mating factor binds. Okay, so therefore then they came up with, this was kind of their conclusion, the signal transduction pathway of how it all happens was their confused, conf, confusion, conclusion. Okay, fine tuning of the response. So there's four aspects of fine tuning um, to consider. One of them is amplification of the signal and that's just more of an elaborate enzyme cascade kind of. So Essentially, therefore, you can have small, smaller numbers of signaling molecules that can release hundreds of, of um, responses. So let me give you an example. Like your textbook uses the example, and this is a good one. Your textbook uses the example of having um, a small molecule like epinephrine, the hormone epinephrine, uh, going through the membrane. Because like I said, most of the hormones go through the membrane and their transduction pathways happen inside the cytosol because they're connected to, or they bind to um, the intracellular proteins, receptors. Okay, so let's say you have epinephrine going through, and that's a relatively small molecule, um, but that one molecule can release hundreds of glucose monomers, which we just saw in the previous slide, in the form of glucose 1-phosphate, right? So that's what we call amplification, where you're taking one and you can produce hundreds from the one. Okay, and then you can also have specificity of the response. And that just means that um, usually we have different checkpoints for response regulation along the way. And so different kinds of cells can turn on different genes and then therefore, you know, different kinds of cells have different collections of proteins and all that kind of stuff. So it's very specific. And then overall efficiency of the response is usually enhanced by what we call scaffolding proteins. And the scaffolding proteins, which I'll show you a picture in a second, they're pretty much just large relay proteins to which many of the, of the um, other relay proteins attached to. So it's kind of like, you know, a big truck that holds a lot of cargo in a way. And the rate of the protein-protein interaction is usually not limited by diffusion anymore. Okay, and then the last thing you can have is the termination of the signal. And so that's actually just the ability of the cell to receive new signals depending on um, and it, or it's dependent on the reversibility of changes produced by um, any of the prior signals. Okay, so this is just kind of a picture to go a little bit more in depth of the specificity. Essentially, you know, what this is showing is that the same signaling molecule, depending on the receptor and depending on the relay molecules and the different types of proteins that are there, the same signaling molecule can actually have different responses, right? So this one molecule binds to this receptor and then it activates these two relay molecules and it has response number one. Whereas if you come over here, you've got different proteins, so you have two different responses. And actually both of these two different responses 
are different than response number one, and then so on and so forth. Okay, um, and then here's the one about the scaffolding proteins and how that enhances efficiency. So rather than just relying on diffusion of the large proteins, um, many of the signal pathways are linked together by scaffolding proteins. And like I said, it's it's really you can think of them as almost like a, a big truck, okay? And it's loading a bunch of cargo and it's carrying the cargo with them. And the cargo is going to be in the form of your protein kinases and also your um, activated receptor protein. Okay, and termination of the signal. Um, so for termination of the signal, um, you just really need to know that whenever you're inactivating, those inactivating mechanisms, they are essential. Um, they're an essential aspect of cell signaling. Otherwise, you know, if we don't have a way to reverse these pathways, then we might actually end up just destroying our cells. Um, so if the ligand concentration falls, or, or of course, you know, destroying the cells is one of them, yeah, or, or it could go in the opposite direction where, um, the cell the cells won't stop growing okay and in that case we would we would call that something like that cancer so if the ligand concentration falls fewer receptors will be bound and then the unbound receptors revert to an inactive state okay and so actually that's about it um, the last section of your textbook which I'm not going to talk about over the lecture video is apoptosis and I think a lot of you hopefully are very familiar with that um, concept because of freshman year I don't know how in depth you went into it for freshman year though I, it, it seems not very much in depth but essentially it's really just a programmed cell death and um, if we don't have a you know at first at first thought it, it's like oh wow you know our cells are killing themselves but the thing is, is if you don't have apoptosis, then all kinds of bad things can happen. Diseases can happen, cancers can happen, um, that kind of stuff. So if we don't have our cells killing themselves um, when they are damaged in some way, then, then it's all bad. And actually, one example, I don't even know if you guys know this, but, you know, that's how you're fingers and your toes are formed is because of apoptosis. So if you look at a picture of yourself, which I don't have one on the slides, but if you look at a picture of a baby in the womb and how it grows over time and how their hands and their toes usually look really webbed, right? And so that's actually apoptosis because if we don't have those cells of the webbed, the webbed cells in between the fingers killing themselves off, then you would be born with these webbed hands and webbed feet, right? So... Anyway, something to think about. Um, so make sure you're taking your notes, and if you have any questions, definitely bring them in tomorrow, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.